Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center and to today's convening of America's Town Hall. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. Let us inspire ourselves for the conversation ahead by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the US Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. Now, although everything that we do is devoted to serving that mission of increasing awareness and understanding of the United States Constitution, uh, we're gonna do that today by uh, shining a light on state constitutions. This is a crucial project as part of our uh, learning together because uh, the US Constitution, after all, was directly inspired by the state constitutions drafted between 1776 and 1780. And indeed, the, uh, both the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights were very directly inspired by the Virginia Constitution of 1776, with, which both Jefferson and Madison had by their sides when they drafted the Declaration and the Bill of Rights. Uh, so that's why today's conversation is so meaningful. And I'm so excited to share with you uh, America's greatest expert on the Virginia Constitution, both the original uh, version ratified in 1776 and the current constitution, which was ratified on uh, July 1st, 1971. Uh, he's A.E. Dick Howard, uh, one of America's greatest constitutional scholars and teachers, Warner Booker Distinguished Professor of International Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. Uh, he was executive director of the commission that wrote Virginia's current constitution and directed the referendum campaign for its ratification. He's the author and editor of many important books, including Magna Carta, Text and Commentary, The Road from Runnymede, Commentaries on the Constitution of Virginia, and uh, Democracy's Dawn, a directory of American initiatives on constitutionalism, democracy, and the rule of law in Central and Eastern Europe. Dick and I will talk for a bit, and then we'll be joined by uh, two of America's greatest experts on state constitutions today, Chief Judge Jeffrey Sutton and Emily Zakin. And I'll talk with them about the role of the states in defining constitutional rights today. Uh, so first of all, uh, welcome, uh, Professor Howard. It's such an honor to have you. And why don't we begin, uh, if you could share with our audience, how was it that George Mason's uh, 1776 Virginia uh, declaration uh, ended up almost word for word in the preamble of the Declaration of Independence and in the Bill of Rights. What would tell us about the history of, of Mason's draft and where he got his immortal language? Jeff, thank you so much. I'm excited to be back. I'm an old friend of the center. I've been a visiting scholar at the center a few years back and uh, admire so much the work you're doing. And I'm delighted that you've carved out a moment to talk about state constitutions. And it's very appropriate, I think, that we do this uh, as we approach Independence Day on July the 4th, because it was in Williamsburg in May of 1776 that the delegates of the Virginia Convention, they had become the, the de facto governing body of Virginia in that run up to the revolution. In May of 76, they instructed their delegates in Philadelphia to introduce the uh, resolution for independence. And on the same day, it's interesting, the very same day they set to work on a constitution for Virginia. Indeed, closer to the point, I should point out that um, they actually set to work on two documents, a declaration of rights and then a frame of government, the actual body of the constitution itself. And I emphasize the fact that it was two documents because it was pure John Locke social contract theory, namely you, you articulate the fundamental rights of people in this commonwealth. And then having done that, you move on to write a frame of government that the rights precede. They're not dependent on government, they precede it. Now, all this is beginning to anticipate, as you point out, the Declaration of Independence itself, because the Virginia Declaration of Rights, largely the work of George Mason, uh, was a compendium that drew heavily on British constitutionalism, Magna Carta, the English Bill of Rights of 1689, other documents, and it drew very much on John Locke and his treatise on government, the 
social contract theory. So it's a when you read the Declaration of Rights of 1776, you're looking at a bridge from the hundreds of years of Anglo-American development to American constitutional law itself. Uh, that document, you have to imagine how exciting it was to be present at the dawn of the making of modern constitutions. We take constitutions for granted today. Virtually every country has one. But in the 18th century, it was unclear exactly what you were doing when you wrote a constitution. So these folks in Williamsburg set, set about that task, wrote a Declaration of Rights frame of government, and then they really launched the ship of constitutionalism in a very real sense. So having adopted the Virginia Declaration and frame of government, uh, quickly this idea spread the other colonies emerging states were also writing constitutions and the Virginia document was in that respect very influential. It was then ultimately influential on the Federal Bill of Rights, very much framed indeed mostly the work of James Madison, who <laughs> at age 25 had been a member of the Virginia Convention of 1776. He was there present at the creation. Indeed, this Virginia document would have to be counted, I think, as on the top 10 list of the most important Anglo-American constitutional documents of all time. It even influenced the uh, French Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen in 1789. So as I say, as we approach Independence Day, you see the direct crossover from what was happening in Williamsburg in Virginia, and then what um, was happening in Philadelphia when the Declaration of Independence was, uh, was drawn up. Thank you so much for all of that, for that wonderful history. And I can't resist screen sharing because the language is so striking. There's, there's one, um, I want to begin with section 15, uh, that no free government or the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people, but by a firm adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, and virtue, and by frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. Those are the four classical virtues from Cicero and Aristotle, justice, moderation, temperance, and uh, Fortitude was the other. Where, where, where did Mason get that language? Did he write it on his own or did he take it from some other? Source? Well, you know, Mason, back in those days, we didn't have the kind of organized bar we have today, but Mason had access to his uncle's law library. His uncle had a vast collection of books and people, uh, if you were plantation owner or merchant or shipper or whoever you may be in those days, you had to know something about law. And law in those days was nicely intersected with philosophy and history and jurisprudence. It's clear from that language you just quoted that Mason, like so many of the people of his generation, understood classical teachings. History of Greece, history of Rome, very, it's very clear. Uh, James Madison, for example, in, at Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, they, they clearly were drawing upon what they thought were the teachings of ancient history. I think it's fascinating when we talk about state constitutions, the extent to which these documents are aspirational documents. The federal constitution is fairly sparse. It doesn't go, it has a preamble, but by and large, it sticks to the frame of government itself, where state constitutions go on, so at least these original constitutions, develop the aspirational qualities of citizenship. What, what should the good citizen be? And that section 15 that you just quoted beautifully summarizes in a few words, the bridge not only from British constitutionalism, but from the ancient world as, as well, from, from, from Greece as Rome. I'm happy to say that language is still in the uh, state constitution. Uh, I quote it to my classes, to anybody who'll listen to it with the notion that the, especially that language about Frequent fund re recourse to fundamental principles is lovely language. The notion that uh, constitutions are not static, they don't stand still. However good they are, they have to evolve with the generations, as I'm sure we will be talking about this morning, how over a period of time where the federal constitution has been amended a few times, but never completely rewritten, it has been fairly common in the states to revise constitutions. We in Virginia have had a half a dozen of them, including 1971. And in, in many ways, they track the great social and economic and political debates of each generation. You can read those state constitutions and see the changing times through the 19th, 20th, and into the 21st century. Wonderful. So inspiring that you quote that to your class. I'm very glad that that uh, section is still in the Virginia Constitution. 
Now I have to ask you, of course, about section one. I'll, I'll just read it because it sounds so much like the famous second sentence of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Jefferson must have been clearly influenced by that as he wrote the Declaration. Where did Mason get that language from? Well, when you read that, if you've read John Locke's treatise on, on government, you see how Lockean this language is. It, it imagines a state of nature. I mean, not the one that actually existed historically, but the analytical notion that you can think about government as being something which assumes an earlier status of people in a state of nature, then they enter into a state of society. But in creating a government, as they merge into this organized society, they do not leave their rights behind. They bring with them those inherent rights. And, you know, today we, we talk about human rights. That's the language of international law, of international concourse today. Natural rights in the 18th century were the analog of what we would talk about as being, being human rights. So this is perfect. John Locke would have loved this. He would understand that. Uh, I think the generation who wrote these early state and finally, the federal constitution were very steep. They all had read John Locke as well as the other uh, treatises of their of their time, and they they would have agreed this this was almost uh, something <laughs> that you would almost take for granted. That stating making this declaration at the beginning of the constitution, uh, you are stating something which an Englishman at the same time could not have pointed to in his or her constitution that as in, as wonderful as British constitutional, constitutionalism was in the 18th century, and as wonderful as Locke's theories were, the English had not put into play the statement that you find in section one of the Virginia Constitution. So we are here at the threshold of not only articulating fundamental rights, but beginning the building blocks of modern American constitutionalism. And John Marshall and Marbury versus Madison would have understood and agreed with this language. So in many ways, Mason is speaking for his generation of people who had in, inherited these ideas, had put them into play and beginning the process that we, I'm happy to say, are heir to today. Uh, beautifully put. Well, now let's talk about further developments in Virginia's constitution after the founding era. Uh, there was a progressive constitution written during Reconstruction in 1870, but then a remarkably regressive post-Reconstruction constitution of 1902, which was grounded in white supremacy and aimed at the mass disenfranchisement of African Americans. Uh, that was the constitution that you set out to revise in 1971. Tell us about that 1902 constitution, what some of its most progressive uh, elements were and how you set about to revise it when the time came. You're quite right in saying the 1870 constitution, that was the reconstruction period, <clears throat> the Southern state, the former Confederate states, in order to re be readmitted to the union, had to agree to, to ratify the 14th amendment and to write a new state constitution, which would recognize the franchise rights of African-Americans, former slaves and, and freemen alike. And so 1870 was clearly a step forward. It also was the first statement in Virginia of a public education system, also meant to help bring newly enfranchised African-Americans into the mainstream of society. Sadly, after the end of Reconstruction, the last federal troops left the South in 1877. And then we, we were drawn into what we look back unhappily as the post-Reconstruction period. Every Southern state then rewrote its Reconstruction constitutions to move, try to put turn the clock back. They they couldn't reinstitute slavery. Obviously, the Thirteenth Amendment took care of that, but they were going to push the clock as far back as they could, and basically push blacks, African Americans, out of the mainstream of society as much as they could. Other states had led the way. So by 1902, in Virginia, uh, it's it, not surprising, but still shocking to read the debates of the. Virginia Convention of 1901-1902, because it is page after page built upon uh, proclamations of white supremacy. 
the notion that the Anglo-Saxons <clears throat> are inherently meant to rule the world. You can almost see the imperialistic kind of thrust in the language of 1902. And they say delegates were there avowedly as representing the white society and equally intent on disenfranchising every black Virginian that they could. And they were very successful at that. They used the poll tax. They had uh, understanding requirements. You wanted to go to the registrar and, and sign up to vote. The registrar could put before you the Virginia Constitution, open it at random to any section, and ask you to interpret it. Well, there are sections of the Virginia Constitution I can't completely interpret. And it was clear in 1902, after that Constitution was, was promulgated, that if you went to the registrar and you were the wrong color, you were a person of, you were African American, you were not going to satisfy that registrar, you, no matter what you said. You might be educated at college educated. You still, you weren't going to get the vote. So most blacks of that era knew that it was a futile gesture to go and register. They wouldn't even, wouldn't give up a day's pay to go and be turned away at the registrar's office. Virginia's uh, reg um, polls showed that in 1867, about half of the registered voters in Virginia were black. In 1904, after this um, post-Reconstruction Constitution was adopted, it plunged to below 5%. And that was the beginning of machine rule and so-called bird machine in Virginia for decades went on based on this, the poll tax, the registration requirements, the other uh, limitations of the 1902 Constitution. That was what we inherited. In the 1960s, the, the impetus for change was clearly in the air because think about the national scene. It was the decade that the Supreme Court had decreed one person, one vote. Uh, the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965 was in place, including Virginia and the other Southern states. The um, poll tax had been declared unconstitutional by the US Supreme Court. So it was federal initiatives were in the air. And I think the impetus for the rewriting of Virginia's constitution was that the leaders of the state wanted to basically reclaim primacy in that they wanted the future of their citizens to be in the hands of their own people and not have to be told what to do by, by federal courts. So the governor in 1968, Governor Mills Godwin, called for the creation of a commission on constitutional revision. Uh, and that was brought into being. It, it included some amazing people, Lewis Powell, who later sat on the US Supreme Court, Hardy Dillard, later a member of the World Court at The Hague. Oliver Hill, who was the leading civil rights attorney in Virginia. He was the Thurgood Marshal of Virginia at that, at that time. Uh, a number of people of that stature, two former governors sat on the commission. It was a, a bipartisan commission, Democrat and Republican, and very progressive. I think they picked up the instinct that they really had to take the Virginia Constitution into their own hands. So they were really... I think as the framers of the present constitution saw it really two tasks at hand. One was retrospective, namely to close the door on the legacy of the 1902 constitution. They did that, uh, they put education into the Bill of Rights into George Mason's Declaration of Rights. So it's education becomes a fundamental right alongside speech and the other fundamental rights. They made it a, laid a mandate on the General Assembly to provide education for every school of, of uh, school age, every child of school age in, in Virginia, and a mandate on localities, counties and cities to put up their share of the money then dictated by the General Assembly. And the point of that was to make it impossible to have massive resistance, which had clouded Virginia after Brown versus Board of Education, we had school closing, Prince Edward County being the ugliest and most memorable example of a generation of black children not receiving public education. So one of the purposes of the revisors, the framers of the present Virginia Constitution was to close that door and make that sort of thing impossible to happen again. And by the way, added to the uh, Declaration of Rights of Virginia, an anti-discrimination clause had never been one in the Virginia Constitution. So there's now a provision that says that there shall be no governmental discrimination based on race, religion, national origin, and, and the like. So 
that was the retrospective. Then the prospective was to try to nudge Virginia in the direction of quality education for every child in Virginia. I won't go into details of that, but it, the framers of the Constitution did not want to empower the courts to tell the uh, legislators and the uh, administrators what to do, but they wanted to come as close to that goal of equity in education as, as they could. Uh, so not a perfect constitution, but uh, not a bad, not a bad one by any means. I think one has stood the test of time. Uh, not a bad one at all. Thanks to you for your superb work in helping draft it. It was ratified overwhelmingly by voters in 1970, uh, uh, and uh, it now celebrates its 50th anniversary. Um, Dick Howard, we're so grateful to you for having educated us about the history and current um, state of the Virginia Constitution, and that perfectly sets up our next conversation with uh, our two guests who I will welcome uh, right now. Um, Judge Jeffrey Sutton uh, serves on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Um, he uh, is one of America's most distinguished appellate judges, scholars, and commentators on the Constitution. And his uh, wonderful book, uh, 51 Constitutions, um, is a model for using state constitutions to uh, uh, interpret um, our rights in diverse and pluralistic ways. And Emily Zakin is uh, a PhD from Princeton University. She is the author of Looking for Rights in All the Wrong Places, Why State Constitutions Contain America's Positive Rights. Um, uh, and she uh, is uh, also very well situated to share with us the state of state constitutions today. So welcome uh, Judge Sutton and Professor Zakin. And uh, Jeff Sutton, let me um, start with you. You heard Professor Howard talk about the Virginia Constitution's uh, effort to enshrine a positive right to education. In your wonderful book, 51 Constitutions, you use state constitutions treatment of a positive right to education as a case study for how states, after the US Supreme Court refused to find a positive right to equal educational funding, um, reached a different conclusion on their own and you view this as a model of Pluralism. So tell us about the story of education in the state constitutions. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, it's great to be with Emily and Professor Howard. Um, thank you for all the work the National Constitution Center is doing, not just in celebrating our national constitution, but educating us about our 50 other constitutions. Um, you know, a way to chat about the uh, education uh, provisions in our state constitutions is actually to start where Dick Howard left off. And to think about Jim Crow, one of the great liberty equality failures in American history. And just remember, as I have a right arm and a left arm, Jim Crow is a double failure. It's a failure at the federal level with the US Supreme Court decision in Plessy, and it's a failure in the Southern states not to use democracy, their constitutions to protect individuals from discrimination. So my goal and the thing we really should be working towards is strengthening the right and the left arm so that kind of double failure never happens again. Sometimes the problems we face in American government aren't quite as easy. It's obvious we should not have segregation, separate but equal. Education funding is a much more complicated problem. It's not that there aren't some very stark situations where some school districts have a lot less revenue than others to meet their uh, challenges and the needs of their students. It's just got a lot of moving parts and complexities. In 1973, the US Supreme Court refused to recognize a fundamental right to equal education between wealthy and poor school districts. In many ways, this is the bookend case to Brown and it looked like some of Brown's promises were not going to be fulfilled because while there was no longer Segregation was no longer permitted. How much good was that doing us if we had communities that were under, underserved and did not have the resources to provide an adequate education? Well, it turns out in this area, there's not just an equal protection clause or due process clause in our 50 state constitutions. They also have their own 
adequacy, thorough and efficient education clauses. And since 1973, in almost these 50 years, two thirds to three quarters of our state courts have recognized some form of constitutional protection to prohibit this kind of inequity. Um, so it's a really great example of why our 51 constitutions offer two opportunities, two shots in every state in the country for some form of relief. And the goal is to have both protections, federal and state, but at a minimum, as Jim Crow illustrates, we have a real problem when there's a double failure. And that is not what happened um, in education equality. And I'll, I'll let um, Professor Zach, and we're, we're gonna go by Emily and Jeff today, but her book, uh, Looking for Rights in All the Wrong Places, is just this wonderful book that not only talks about the second shot, but talks about it as a positive right. And I'll, I'll let Emily take it from there since she's really the one that innovated this idea. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful tee up and for the description of the right to education in your own book, whose title I should uh, accurately state, 51 Imperfect Solutions, States and the Making of American Constitutional Law. Uh, Professor Zagan, you, uh, as, as Judge Sutton suggests, write in your important book that most of the world's, like most of the world's constitutions, state constitutions contain positive rights relating to education, labor, social welfare, and the environment. Let's focus on education as our case study because because uh, DeCarrot and Judge Sutton have set it up so well. Tell us about when the first state constitutions began to protect a positive right to education and how that evolved throughout the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on this really illustrious panel. Um, yes, American state constitutions have mentioned education and mandated that states foster education since before the U.S. Constitution. So the Massachusetts Constitution says that the state has to be involved in fostering education. And it said that before the U.S. Constitution was written. Um, but I think one of the really important things to remember is that when we focus on the second shot, one thing you could think is, well, it's secondary, right? It's just, it's, we are, our real values, our highest principles are in the Bill of Rights. And when you read that, education's not in there. And in fact, this is what the court says in Rodriguez. We read it and we don't see education. And so I think from that, people have concluded, well, I guess education rights aren't among America's really most cherished rights. Really what Americans want is just being left alone. So the Bill of Rights is sometimes described as a list of thou shalt nots. The, there's, the state has to leave me alone, let me say what I want, let me practice my religion, not search my house, just keep government away from me. And some people think, well, okay, maybe these things are in state constitutions, but surely that's secondary. But in fact, one of the things I argue in my book is that it's not secondary at all. This is a product of America's political history, that we had states before we had the U.S. Constitution, and it was these states that were providing goods like education. And so if you wanted to ensure that there was a public education system, you would go to your state and say, please set that up. In fact, states do, and, and especially before the 1930s, did an enormous amount of social policy provision. And so it made sense that these rights would end up in state constitutions. This is not to say that they're lesser rights, that they mean less to Americans than the rights in the federal constitution. It's simply that states were the ones doing this kind of governance. And so the, the constitutions of these states then reflect these demands for um, goods from government. Fascinating. Uh, Judge Sutton, t uh, tell us about um, uh, current debates about another, another round on, on education and, and the degree to which constitutional as opposed state constitution as opposed to federal constitutional interpretation may be the most promising area for reform. What's going on in the state now with regard to education? And is there a diversity of views? Yeah, I mean, this, it's, it's really such a rich area to illustrate the values of state constitution, state legislation, and how it really complements the national debate. So one way to think about our education clauses in, is to go back to Brandeis. And you know, Brandeis has this wonderful insight of states as laboratories of experimentation. Now, what he was referring to was state legislatures as the laboratories of experimentation. And I, I think there are very few people that think he's wrong about that. You have a new problem like education equality, um, 
data privacy, opioids, no one knows the answer. So we try different things. I think the thing Emily and I are both trying to get people to think about is remember that our state courts can also be laboratories of experimentation. And one thing that those um, experiments that trial and error can do is sometimes the trial and error will help us realize there really are three or four different approaches. They're all equally strong. They all have kind of equal vices. There really is no winning insight that ought to be nationalized. Other times, you will generate a consensus. You'll generate a winning insight that ought to be nationalized. And I, you know, Professor Zakin and I have not talked about this, but I suspect we both agree that education equality and education funding is, is very tricky. It's a very tricky thing to sort out. Um, we know we've had national legislation with economic support and some economic, you know, some standards, but I probably am on the side that says, we're still looking for that magic eureka insight that is worth nationalizing. It's not because we don't appreciate the very serious equity problems, but sometimes if you nationalize too early, and this is actually the thesis of my chapter in 51 Imperfect Solutions about school funding, if you nationalize too early, you run the risk of losing by winning. In other words, the national standard because it's national, because it has to apply to 330 million people, thousands of school districts actually might be too low. It might be too ungenerous, but because it's a national rule, people will hesitate to go beyond it. So one of the things that's very tricky is going back to Brandeis, when have you gotten the insight that needs to be nationalized and when do you stick with trial and error? And for me, the last 50 years, have been very positive. I mean, I think there's a lot of really great insights that the state courts and even state legislatures have developed, identified. Um, but I'm not sure, for, speaking for me, that I, I've yet, I don't know that this is one of those situations where you could say, aha, they've now proved Rodriguez was wrong and we now need to revisit Rodriguez. But theoretically, that is how this should work. Um, the US Supreme Court puts up a stop sign, they say, we don't think there's a national right here. Let the states experiment. And if the experiment really generates winning insights and portable to other states and eventually the national government, whether Congress or the US Supreme Court, why then you've got this dynamic federalism where at some point the US Supreme Court could reconsider Rodriguez. Uh, for me, that, that insight hasn't emerged, but I'm probably on the slightly stingy side of federal innovation of rights. Uh, so I can imagine reasonable responses in the other direction. Fascinating. Uh, uh, Professor Zakin, uh, what are your thoughts about how state courts today are grappling with the Rodriguez question? And are you more optimistic than Judge Sutton that there might be some kind of consensus that could be nationalized eventually? Oh, I fear I'm more pessimistic. Huh. I, so I, I think, I wish if I had a magic wand, Rodriguez would have come out differently. I think I wish that there had been a federal right to education. Um, and I think that wouldn't have foreclosed states from interpreting their own state constitutions as having even rights above and beyond the national minimum. But I think these can work in tandem and pull in the same direction. I think what we saw instead was that as the federal Supreme Court shut that door, people turned to their states and they said, well, if that one door is shut at the federal level, maybe there's a second chance here. Maybe states, we can do it through states. I think from the perspective of equality or educational equalization, that's not quite as good. It's more efficient to have a single voice at this, the federal level saying we're going to enforce some kind of minimum, but it's certainly better than nothing. And here, I think that, um, I guess because I'm a political scientist, I think this has an important lesson about federalism, that one of the nice things about our federal system is that it gives the losers a pl another point of entry, another way to kind of keep fighting and kind of keeps the losing side in the game. And so although the federal Supreme Court says, we just don't see it, we don't think the 14th Amendment has a right to education or even anywhere in the US Constitution, people who said, no, there must be a right to this had another venue, they had this sort of state level Level option. And they kept this um, kind of politics, this movement for educational equality alive. I think that's a very valuable thing about state level politics and fe American federalism generally. Thank you so much for that.
Uh, Judge Sutton, you introduced the question of uh, state courts and public schools and also Brandeis, the laboratories of democracy metaphor. I was struck by Justice Breyer's memorable sentence in the recent Mahoney decision, American public schools are the nurseries of democracy that seemed to invoke uh, his hero uh, and uh, Justice Brandeis as well as Tocqueville's uh, suggestion that the American jury is a gratuitous public school where citizens can learn their rights. My question to you is, can you, um, one of the case studies you give in your book, uh, 51 Imperfect Solutions is mandatory flag salutes under the first amendment and shows that state courts don't have to be perfect to affect change at a national level. Is there a similar free speech debate about online free speech in state courts based on state constitutions and are state courts coming to different conclusions about where to draw the line between on and off campus speech online um, in ways that uh, the Supreme Court might uh, draw on? Yes, yeah, I love that question. I love Justice Breyer's opinion. Um, well, the, the our historical story about mandatory flag salutes during World War II has, I guess I would say two lessons. Lesson one, in my view, is you can't trust the courts. It's, it's very dangerous to live in a society where we Americans decide that liberty, equality are only protected in the state or federal court, state or federal constitutions. I mean, eventually it has to be a character, virtue in the people that's going to protect these things over the long haul. And the message of the flag salute story is that in Gabitis at the US Supreme Court and the state court decisions in the early parts of World War II, everybody dropped the ball. Everybody was focused on the patriotic zeal of beating Germany and against anybody that wanted to have a dissenting voice. Happily, the federal and state courts turn around. And I think that's where the laboratories helped a little bit. I, I don't think, I think it helped when it came to Barnett that by the time of Barnett, a lot of state courts had criticized Gabitis, said you got that wrong, used their state constitutions, and that just the kind of dialogue that I think we ought to have. Now let's shift to Justice Breyer's opinion today. And boy, I, you know, I'm a former, I taught seventh grade geography for two years before going to law school. I'm married to a seventh grade English teacher. We've had three children. Let me promise you, we understand this debate. And I'll tell you what we really understand is how complicated it is. And if we got 25 parents in a room, we probably have 35 perspectives on this issue. And you know, this is a great example to me where I thought the court simultaneously did its job of explaining the national rule, the national backstop, but then just as you quoted Justice Breyer, left states and federal governments, state and federal courts, state and federal constitutions some latitude to work through this. Because I mean, if there, there's one thing we can all agree about, free speech is gonna have some slightly different permutations in a school world, particularly if you're involuntarily there, local parentis versus outside of school. And then of course you have youth versus adult. And so it's, it's just a very sensitive area. And then when you add to it, our new technologies, um, I don't even know what to do. I mean, I, I, you know, I talk to my kids, I'm not sure they believe in privacy anymore. They seem, privacy seems to be another word for loneliness. Uh, so, I, you know, it just seems everybody wants to let the world know what they're doing. And that's a shifting norm and the shifting constitutions, state or federal have got to account for shifting norms. And clearly the internet, Snapchat and the like are creating shifting norms. And Boy, in a world like that, as a federal judge, I say all hands on deck. I want all 10,000 judges in this country working through this, being sensitive. Don't think there's necessarily a one size fits all solution at the outset. Be humble and you know, God bless experimentation. God bless experimentation. Bob. Brandeis couldn't have said it uh, better. And that expression of humility in the face of a very difficult social, technological, and cultural solution is exactly what uh, state constitutions and pluralism are designed to encourage. Uh, Professor Zagam, can you cast any light on the way that uh, state constitutions have treated free speech rights over time? And, and, and then you might pr uh, perhaps introduce another of the big topics that you explore in your book, namely the treatment of state constitutions and uh, social welfare or climate change legislation. Oh, sure. Well, one thing I wanted to underscore from um, Judge Sutton's comments that I totally agree with 
is this that this sometimes this laboratories of experimentation idea can evoke sort of um, the idea that these are insulated, hermetically sealed boxes where people go off and and sometimes people read state constitutions and they think what weird, strange, idiosyncratic documents. Um, but instead, as Judge Sutton I think really beautifully illustrates in his work, they, this is a, a whole country sort of working to figure out these problems. So these are national political debates like free speech and and how to understand free speech on the internet um, being worked out through state level institutions, both constitutions and legislatures and courts. And so I think one of the things I'm often writing in response to is the idea that state constitutions are their own strange state level, state specific things. And I say, no, no, no. This is just a second level of the federal government and, and national constitutional controversies are worked out at the state level through state courts and state constitutions. These aren't, these aren't strange. So I, I think laboratories is right in that we're all working on it, um, but not, they're not sealed off. <laughs> they're, we're looking to, they're looking to each other and even in the drafting of state constitutions. Um, state constitutional convention delegates would bring with them copies of other state constitutions. They would say, well, Ohio says this and Montana says that, that there's a real sort of synthetic quality to this experimentation. Okay, um, and then I, about environmentalism. Um, yeah, so one of the, the cases in my book is about environmental politics. And I mostly look at rights added to state constitutions in the 1960s and 1970s, rights to a healthy environment, to clean air and clean water. And one of the reasons I find that case so interesting and that I selected it is that the 60s and 70s were a heyday of national policymaking, especially on the left. So there was a sense that, that most things could be fixed by the fe among lefties, the federal government could fix them. Um, and, and the Environmental Protection Agency gets set up and lots of federal regulations are passed. And so I didn't want to leave readers with the impression that it was only in the 19th century that people cared about state constitutions. And then once the federal government got bigger started, got more active after the New Deal, we sort of forgot about them. I wanted to say, look, state constitutions remain relevant, even for people who are also interested in federal level policymaking. Even they're not losers, they're making headway at the federal level. And still they turn to their state constitutions and they add these environmental rights. And one of the reasons is that states control a lot of land. They control reservoirs, they control state forests. And so people are really trying to tell their state legislatures through these constitutions, here's how to manage these things. And another reason is that movements are really interested in um, creating visible banners for their movement. And rights are excellent banners for movement building. And so when you put in a state constitution, we have the right to a healthy environment. Um, then, then the next thing that movement does, the environmental groups that, that got that right into the constitution do, is they publish newsletters and they say, we have this right and we got it in there. And they go to the state legislature and they say, we have this right, we have this right, do something. And I think this also underscores one of Judge Sutton's points about how we, don't just trust courts, that rights enforcement is really a, a multi-branch project and social movements use all of the tools at their disposal, not just litigation to do this kind of rights enforcement. Thank you so much for that. Uh, the Q&A box is full of excellent questions. There's one from Fred Dugan, please define what the Virginia framers meant by the term happiness. I have to take that one just because I'm writing about it now, although of course, Professor, um, Howard could cast a wonderful light on it. When the framers talked about happiness, they had in mind not feeling good, but being good. Virtue is the foundation of happiness, said Jefferson, citing Epicurus. And Franklin and Adams and Washington again and again insisted that only by mastering our unreasonable passions like anger, jealousy, and fear could we achieve the classical virtues of temperance, moderation, prudence, and fortitude that were the foundation of happiness, uh, which they defined as flourishing. It comes from Aristotle's uh, Nicomachean ethics. Only by uh, virtue or excellence can we achieve long-term well-being, which consists in fulfilling our potential and serving others. So it's uh, really important to see that connection between virtue and happiness, because after all, they thought that without individual self-government, the government of the self, we couldn't achieve collective self-government, uh, that is government uh, uh, democratically with others. Crucial question and great uh, to see, it's, it's, it's all in that provision of the Virginia Declaration, which we read and which Professor Howard cast such great light on. Um, yeah, Judge, Judge, can I could I interject to Virginia? Please, uh, teach, uh, teach, teach more about that crucial question about virtue and happiness. Yes, please. Uh, uh, well, I'm I'm still working on virtue and happiness, so I'm not <laughs> going to help you there. But I, I since we started out with Virginia, it's a nice segue to something Emily was emphasizing. Um, 
So Jefferson and Madison, great Virginians, of course, maybe the two greatest, um, agreed on almost everything politically, but disagreed starkly on how often Constitution should be amended. Jefferson had the view that each generation ought to be able to reinvent itself, have a new convention, start anew, figure out what was fundamental, what wasn't, what new structures should be developed. Madison was very anxious about that approach and thought longevity was the key, that would lead to veneration. And what that led to is a world in which the US Constitution is almost impossible to amend, three quarters of the states required. Almost all the state constitutions require just 51%. Why is that so important with things like environmental rights, labor rights, education rights? Well, since 1776, the states, because it's so easy to amend constitutions, offer this incredible set of evidence and proof as to what Americans want. And we, we just see through each era as they add labor protections in the progressive era, environmental protections in the 60s and 70s, education in the 19th century. Whereas the US constitution is still largely fixed in an 18th century mode. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. The one thing I know is important is it's, if you're gonna have a federal constitution fixed in 18th century America, it is awfully nice to have easily amendable state constitutions enforced mm. by state courts. And, but for that easy amendability, Emily would not have been able to write her book because that book is all about constitutions that you could amend by adding say direct democracy and all of these other innovations. But what's so fascinating is the divide between this national approach and the state approach. It looks like the Grand Canyon at this point, it just gets farther and farther apart. And I think it's good. I think they can still complement each other, but you have to wonder sometimes if it might be unhealthy. Uh, Professor Zekin, is it, is it good or unhealthy? Uh, Judge Sutton makes the case for why it's good since the federal constitution is so hard to amend. And yet there are charges that constitutions like the California constitution, which is so easy to amend by initiative, uh, just has a whole bunch of uh, constitutionalized uh, rules that uh, shouldn't reach the constitutional level. So what do you think? I think there are trade-offs. So I, I think that one really excellent thing about having a flexible, easily amended constitution is this democracy promoting feature. And in fact, I saw a number of times um, when courts were issuing decisions that people didn't like, they said, fine, we can just overturn our state high court by putting the thing we want directly in the constitution. I think that's really appealing from a democracy promoting perspective. Pe the people are speaking here. And in cases where there's direct democracy, where you can change a constitution without even asking the legislature just through an initiative and referendum process, I think that's the clearest example where the, the people can speak aside from um, and, and to and against their elected representatives or their their um, courts. I think, though, that there are downsides. So one downside to having an easily amended constitution is that it does not as good a job of protecting minoritarian rights. And that if a whole majority wants to see something, they can just put it right in the constitution. And um, sometimes that means that minority rights get trampled. And so I don't, I don't have an answer to which is better, but I, I think it's probably best to look at the strengths of these flexible constitutions and then their weaknesses too. Oh, one thing I also wanted to add is that the, US, the text of the US Constitution is very stable. It's been amended very few times, it's very hard to change. On the other hand, the meaning of the US Constitution has changed over and over and over again. That's actually proved quite flexible, at least the lived meaning or the political meaning. As the Supreme Court has interpreted and reinterpreted it, as doctrine has accreted and morphed, the meaning of the US Constitution is actually, I would say, as flexible as the text of state constitutions. Well, that's a great uh, point. And one dramatic example of how the text of the US Constitution has evolved um, is the due process clause. And before the panel started, Judge Sutton, you were saying that the Supreme Court's doctrine of substantive due process, which let's disaggregate for our friends, it's not intuitive, but the due process clause of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment says that no state, as well as Congress, can deprive individuals of liberty without due process of law. The Supreme Court has interpreted that flexibly to mean that there are some liberties that are so fundamental that they can't be deprived even with due process. So they're, they're fundamental rights. They're called, this is called substantive due process. And this gives the Supreme Court a lot of leeway to basically decide on its own which rights it thinks are so fundamental that they can't be deprived. 
Now, Judge Sutton, talk about the evolution of the due process clause at the state level. And you, were, you tantalizingly said that you had a deal that you wanted to see if Professor Zakin would take uh, when it came to substantive due process and state constitutions. Well, uh, yes, thank you. Um, well, let me put, um, before I uh, and propose the deal, let me put a few cards on the table so you know my perspective. And my perspective is to be fairly grouchy about substantive due process. As a federal judge, it makes me very nervous that um, life tenured federal judges would have authority to innovate new rights. Um, uh, you know, you have to ask yourself, how often have substantive due process decisions at the federal courts been inconsistent with the policy preferences of the judges who are making those decisions? And that's not rule of law. That makes me nervous. In fact, in one of my opinions, I actually say it would be more for it fair and more neutral to roll the dice before a substantive due process decision than to have the actual judge decide what he, whether he or she thinks such a right should exist. So I'm fairly stingy about the idea, but I'm also um, trying to be humble that I could be wrong, number one, and number two, recognize this reality. For better or worse, we have had substantive due process for quite a long time. One idea here is to use the states, state courts, state legislatures to help legitimize at least some types of substantive due process interpretation. The key thing that substantive due process allows a federal court to do is to amend the constitution by interpretation. Now that should make someone nervous. Uh, you get nominated, confirmed, become a life tenured federal judge, but they don't give you an eraser pen <laughs> or a pen that allows you to add words to the constitution. That's not part of the situation. So the key thing you do by amendment by interpretation is you avoid, you sidestep, you end run the three quarters of the state's requirement. So to me, the only way to legitimize substantive due process is to give it some linkage to proof that norms have shifted in the states to that kind of super majoritarian degree. And I think this is very helpful whether it comes to innovating new rights one might see, see Obergefell is an example of something that got to the three quarters. Uh, you can still say, as grouchy Judge Sutton says, not the way it should be done, but if we're going to do it, it does seem to me a lot more legitimate when the federal court, as Justice Kennedy did in Obergefell, acknowledges this norm shifting in the states, which proves it's not just the individual views of the justice, it has objective proof elsewhere. This also can be useful for deciding what substantive due process precedents to preserve. In other words, if you announce the decision and you still can't get a supermajority, I think the court, the federal courts just have to acknowledge that what they did really has some illegitimacy because they sidestepped the three quarters. And even after decades, the decision still hasn't been accepted. I guess the last point, and this is why I hope Professor Zakin and I can reach Maybe a deal is a little bit of an exaggeration, but um, I think we both recognize that if you look at the broad scope, all of American history, substantive due process can be used for very conservative goals, very progressive goals, very in the middle goals. And so whatever we do as Americans, you know, please don't take the simple route of substantive due process for me, but not for thee. Uh, I mean, that's, that's silly and strikes me as well, to go back to you, Jeff, uh, not a recipe for happiness or for that matter, virtue. Huh. Wonderful. Well, um, uh, Professor Zakin, what do you think of Judge Sutton's deal? I, I hear him proposing uh, a willingness to entertain the possibility of substantive due process at the federal level, but uh, guided by state constitutional development and saying that federal judges should not recognize new substantive due process rights unless they've been recognized in state constitutions and decisions and in deciding which substantive due process precedents to maintain, they should see whether or not a consensus has developed in the states. If I've properly stated the deal, would you would you take it? <laughs> I don't know that I would go that far, although I think I, I see the I see the logic. I think this makes sense. I think the, the downside, of course, again, is if you think rights should not be subject to majoritarian decision making. So one way of thinking about rights is that even if most people haven't accepted them, they still exist and courts are there to protect them. And if that's your view, um, that, that there's some things that no matter how many people want to take them away from you, they shouldn't be taken away and that courts should be there to protect you, then um, that wouldn't be a great deal. 
On the other hand, I think that heroic view of counter-majoritarian decision-making is pretty fictional. We very rarely see it. And much more often, and here's where I am in complete agreement with Judge Sutton, we see actually majoritarian decisions coming from the bench. And so substantive due process in the early 20th century was entirely conservative. It was a kind of union busting, no minimum wage, laissez-faire liberalism um, kind of provision, and the left hated it. And then by the 1960s, when, it, when substantive due process is, is a way to get to privacy and reproductive rights, then the left is all for it. And so I do absolutely think there's been this switch and it's been political and partisan and um, it, it doesn't, in real life, substantive due process um, hasn't been just a kind of simple uh, human rights story. It's been much more complicated and much more partisan. Thank you so much for that. Well, for what it's worth, Judge Sutton, um, I will take the deal, or at least I would if I were allowed <laughs> to have opinions. As a, as a young, overconfident law student, I, I wrote a note saying that uh, state, the U.S. Supreme Court should look to state constitutions in deciding which rights were natural and unenumerated, and uh, noted Justice Scalia's uh, opinion that uh, they should do the same thing in deciding which rights, w w which forms of punishment have become cruel and unusual under the Eighth Amendment. So um, it sounds like a good good compromise to Jeff. It sounds like you're the source for both Emily's and my work because <laughs> not at all. No, hardly wrote any of this. <laughs> it was a juvenile uh, effort, but, but but rooted in the same instinct that if you're going to um, try to discern the traditions and collective conscience of our people, as as Justice Harlan Grandly said, you should actually look to concrete examples of texts and and debates on the ground, which is what both of your work has centrally uh, reminded us of. Well, we have just uh, enough time for uh, closing statements um, in this fascinating debate. So uh, Judge Sutton, the first one is to you. Why are state constitutions important and why should Americans care about them today? Well, um, first of all, thank you again for inviting us. Uh, I've just really enjoyed being on the program. It's wonderful to be with Professor Zakhanum. I've never met, but I've relied on her book so many times. So it's really wonderful to be here. And thank you, Jeff, to you and your team for um, having some programs about state constitutions. I mean, there's a massive education gap. The last time there was a study on this, 52% of Americans didn't even realize their state had a constitution. And while I don't think the voluntary attendance of uh, this virtual program allows me to do this, I'd like to impose a very short assignment that is enforceable only by a healthy conscience, another feature of virtue. Um, and that is to just spend five minutes tonight before you go to bed reading Article One of your constitution, your state's constitution. Uh, most states, um, the only exceptions I'm aware of are Colorado and New Mexico, there may be one or two, but most states in Article One, the first article, that's where they put their Bill of Rights, their Declaration of Rights, their individual rights. What does that tell us? It tells us that the American people, when they first started doing this before 1789 and since, have prioritized individual rights, whether liberty, equality, property. We should, we should go back and look at those rights, look at the language that's often different from the federal, it's often more protective than the federal. And you know, when you a gerrymandering decision like say Rucho comes down that perhaps you don't agree with at the US Supreme Court, maybe like me, you think gerrymandering has been just so hurtful to American democracy, compromise and so forth, you regret that decision all fair, I understand the point. Just remember, that's not the only recourse. Um, state courts like Pennsylvania and North Carolina have shown that they can in, come up with judicially enforceable prohibitions on gerrymandering. State legislatures, state constitutional amendments have developed compromises that have moved the ball positively. So, you know, when the US Supreme Court puts up a stop sign, that's not the end of the matter. Uh, and that's true whether it's a negative or a positive right as Professor Zakin has so helpfully shown. So, I, and I also, last of all, think it's a great source of innovation when we have a new problem. I mean, even the pandemic illustrates this. Did we, want to, did we really wanna have one rule for all primary education across the whole country at the outset? That's, that's a national only approach. We didn't know what we were doing. You have to be humble in the face of that kind of threat and, while there's lots of imperfection illustrated in state and federal governments over the last year and a half, I think we can agree some experimentation was useful 
And, um, and we probably are still in that mode because it's so hard to figure out this difficult problem. Thank you so much for those inspiring words. And thanks for that really meaningful homework. We the people, National Constitution Center friends, please uh, answer Judge Sutton's call and read your state constitution. And if you do and want to write to me, uh, jrosen at constitutioncenter.org and let me know what you learned from it, then we'll know that you uh, did your homework. Um, uh, Professor Zach, and the last word in this great discussion is to you. Why are state constitutions important? Uh, why should our listeners care? And do you have any homework for them as well? Oh, thank you uh, both for inviting me. And um, Judge Sutton's been such a generous reader of my work for so many years. I just, it's a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Um, I guess my thought, my closing thought is, is the thing I close my book with, which is to say that, you know, ideas about who we are really shape who we can become. So one value in reading state constitutions, as Judge Sutton says, there's this pluralism and a richness. There's so much in there. There's such, they're a reflection of um, decades and centuries of political demands on government that to, to read them, I think, gets us out of the bind of thinking, we only want this small set of things from our government. We've only tried this small set of things. And from being stuck in this sort of rigid idea about what the US government is and what our constitutional rights and ideals and fundamental values are. And so I, I echo Judge Sutton in urging people to look at their state constitutions and to do it to kind of liberate our imaginations about what America might be, where we might go. And based on you know, all of the many myriad things we've tried and asked of our governments in the past liberate our imaginations of what our governments might be. What a beautiful way to put it and to close this inspiring discussion. Uh, National Constitution Center friends, thank you so much as always for taking an hour out of your day to educate yourself about the US Constitution by learning about state constitutions. And in addition to the homework that Judge Sutton gave you of reading your state constitution, my homework is please read our guests' wonderful books, uh, Judge Sutton's 51 Imperfect Solutions, States and the Making of American Constitutional Law, and Professor Zakin's Looking for Rights in All the Wrong Places, Why State Constitutions Contain America's Positive Rights. Thanks also to Professor A. Dick Howard for his inspiring words about the Virginia Constitution. And just for good measure, read the Virginia Constitution as well, both the 1776 version and the 1971 version. And just to show that you've done your homework, write to me and tell me what you've learned. Thank you so much, Judge Jeffrey Sutton, Professor Emily Zakin, and Professor A.E. DeCoward. Thanks, We the People friends, and look forward